welcome. My name is Hattie Hartman. I am sustainability editor at the Architects Journal, and I am delighted to be here uh, to host this talk on a crucial topic of our ecological future. Um, we have a fantastic panel, each person approaching this topic from a really different point of view, so this should make for a, for a good discussion. I'll do proper introductions in a moment, but we have a, uh, you're going to hear from Neil Strong from Network Rail, so that's the infrastructure scale. Usman Haq of Umbrellium, who uses digital platforms to engage people. And Andrew Grant, who is working on massive projects in China. And Sue Morgan, who combines strategic and policy measures in her work. And what unites all our speakers here, I think, is making an impact. And during this talk, I also look forward to hearing about sort of top-down versus bottom-up uh, uh, approaches to this complex topic. So I've been writing about this topic for about 15 years, and in the last three years, I've seen it come in and find a seat. I've seen this topic move from the margin to the mainstream in an up-close and personal way. The discourse has changed tremendously, and I saw this just last week. We were judging the AJ Architecture Awards, and it is a fact that projects that do not address climate emergency are not making it through anymore. Uh, but the question is, what does addressing climate emergency and design mean? It's a huge and complicated topic, and it, at least in my experience, landscape doesn't always jump out as one of the top top issues as it should. That is starting to change. Um, landscape is often way too late to the table. So for a long time, climate-led design was all about carbon, and especially the operational uh, carbon in buildings. And now we're talking a lot more about the materials that it takes to build and make buildings and places. But um, fortunately, climate emergency is not only about carbon. And I was really heartened that Three years ago, when Architects Declare and ACAN, the campaign group, the Architects Climate Action Network, burst onto the scene, they made the debate, their manifestos about climate and biodiversity. So I think designers are often way too respectful of the red line that delineates their site. And I think we need to be looking beyond site boundaries now and often even completely reframe a brief that a client may hand you. So I hope we'll hear more about this. Um, the geography and ecology of a place are so important in shaping a design. And um, I was fortunate in my um, Climate Champions podcast that I do with the AJ. I did a whole series on landscape last year. And I one of the people I interviewed was Isabella Tree, absolutely fascinating on rewilding. And uh, I also had landscape architect Joe Gibbons, who speaks quite forthrightly, and she said too often she encounters architects who are designing landscapes with absolutely minimal tuition. And all of this needs to change. Um, a few years back, I wrote a column for the AJ saying that all master plans should be led by landscape architects. That didn't go down too well with the, my target audience, but I got a lot of love from landscape architects. So. Now for our panel. Each panelist is going to speak for five minutes, and then we'll have a discussion amongst the panel for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open to questions from the floor. So get your questions ready. Um, we need to be thinking about infrastructure scale, and that's why I was delighted when I was invited to do this to see that we have uh, Neil Strong from Network Rail here on the panel. He is trained as an ecologist and a forester, and his work supports the sustainable management of the line side, the area adjacent to the track. Um, he's currently working on tools and guidance to enhance biodiversity across the network. And this can have a massive impact because, as Neil will explain, one third of the UK population lives within 500 meters of a rail line. And I'm curious to test this out in this room because I actually live within 100 meters of a rail line. How many people here live within 500 meters of a rail line? That looks like well over a third, actually. <laughs> so, Neil, over to you. Okay.
Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, Anthony and Frank, uh, for putting me up uh, for this uh, as well. Um, my first thought is, what, as a chartered forester, am I doing in the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, giving a presentation, um, especially when I work for the railway? And uh, I think I should be next door, although having seen Sir David Attenborough talk at Natural History Museum, I, I don't think I could quite follow that. So we have some amazing landscapes in, uh, in the whole of Britain and some amazing infrastructure, the design that went into these things uh, all across England, Scotland, and, and this one is the, the Barmouth Viaduct uh, in Wales. We have an estate that covers 51,000 hectares. Uh, having just mentioned Wales, I know most things are done the size of Wales. Um, I use the, the Isle of Wight. Um, 51,000 hectares is the Isle of Wight and a half if you squash it all together. And across that whole estate, we've got an amazing array, a fantastic array of habitats, um, all the way from wildflower meadows, like this one in Scotland, through to places in Bristol where we have tree species that they are the only ones found on the planet, let alone within Britain. And it's that sort of thing that we have to manage when we're trying to run trains safely. We have to do that. We have an obligation to run trains safely. We also need to keep our staff safe when they're working alongside those trains. And we have to move our passengers around safely and on time. And in order to do that, there are occasions when we need to remove the vegetation because it's not in the right place. And when we do that, we come into conflict, not only with the one third of the population, as Hattie said, that live within that 500 metres, but like myself, there are 7 million neighbours who directly look over the fence and wonder what we're doing. And it's that conflict that can happen um, with what we're doing. And that conflict arises a lot of the time because you can see from this image here, many of those seven million neighbours, they don't have the trees, the vegetation of their own. The new builds have not got trees planted in. And that line of houses there, not one of them, there might be a trampoline or two and a couple of sheds, but the only trees that those people will see when they look out their back windows are the ones on the railway. And we need to manage those for all those reasons that I've talked about earlier. And in the urban environment, when you see stations prior to the work that's been done, it's all paving slab and tarmac. There's very little biodiversity, maybe the odd pigeon or two uh, flying around London. And as I say, little or no biodiversity, no habitats at all. If this is our shop window, this is the looking out of the train, uh, somewhere in Hertfordshire, I think. Um, you know, going past it at 125 miles an hour, that's our shop window. And we need to showcase what that opportunity is to the customers who may be standing still and are browsing. And that happens around those station areas. This is where people are going to be looking at the infrastructure and around them. And how can we bring that biodiversity closer to the people? So we've got it along 50-odd thousand hectares of that land, but those for the 2,000 stations, the small, medium stations that the Explore stations looked at, how can we get that interaction with that uh, with those habitats. And the Explore Station progress has, process has done that, and we can see that in this image here. What we need to do is create a green gateway for people when they're travelling. We need to get people back onto the train, onto the rail network, and we can use the station area as that green gateway to a national nature network where we've got that 50-odd thousand hectares of land and all the habitats all over the place in the right places. We're already doing it in some places. We hope that uh, the bees will enjoy the flowers just as much as the passengers on this particular station platform. And it's, there's, you've got that expanse as well. It's all tarmac at the moment. What else can we do? What can we do to make sure that people can enjoy it and actually wait for the trains while something nice is going on? And where we've got the space, we might be able to work with the local communities to plant trees at the backs of those same platforms to make sure they're the right species in the right place. And we're working with those local communities, doing things with them and not to them. And that's why the conversations that have been in some of the earlier presentations about working with those communities to make sure that what we're doing fits in with what their aspirations are. And where we're trying to go to with the Explore Station and then work that I'm doing is to do exactly what it says there, to create that national and natural asset. But what we've got fundamentally running down the middle is that thriving, safe, efficient and a sustainable railway at its heart. 
Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Usman Ak. Um, he's originally trained as an architect and he's the founder of Umbrellium, a consultancy that uses digital platforms to harness collective intelligence. He's just spent four days in Chinatown hosting a, a uh, outdoor table, outdoor venue, encouraging low carbon um, uh, local Asian meals. Uh, he's also worked on uh, issues like air and noise pollution, safety at pedestrian crossings, crossings and urban rewilding. So Usman, over to you. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, so I, I typically work on large-scale, complex systems, um, designing physical spaces, sometimes activated through technology, but pretty much always involving diverse communities and stakeholders. I'm kind of particularly interested in taking what sounds impossible and figuring out how to make it possible today rather than in the future, which is why... Um, responding to the climate emergency is something I'm particularly focused on at the moment. Um, just by way of example, some of the projects I've worked on include the Burbel, which saw hundreds of people collaborate to build an 18-story structure uh, in Singapore. Um, Flight Path Toronto uh, was uh, where we installed zip lines across the city centre for people to explore flying with wings as a means of rapid, uh, rapid transport. Uh, it was uh, um, about... 12 years ago. Starling Crossing is an interactive pedestrian crossing we built in uh, South London that basically puts people first. It responds to people before vehicles. Um, and then finally, VoiceOver, uh, which is a hyper-local social radio network that we installed in living rooms across a, a road in, uh, in East Durham. Basically, a, if you like, a kind of radio network for just for the participants to determine for themselves uh, the kind of content that they could share with each other. So I, I spent a couple of years um, uh, mostly overlapping with the pandemic as creative director on a project called Rewild Royal Docks, uh, which is a project initiated by Eden Lab, uh, affiliated with the Eden Project. And for the project, uh, I was uh, developing a 10-year vision for wilding East London. I did this in conjunction with the Royal Docks teams, um, with a number of organizations uh, across Newham. Um, now, while we're very close to kicking it off last year, uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be going ahead, but I thought it'd be, it'd be useful to just talk through uh, some of the kind of key themes. Because um, in my opinion, uh, urban wilding really is, you know, it's, a, it's, the, it's the 21st century equivalent of the space race. It's something that we all have to come together to figure out how to make it work. It's a vital strategy for responding to the climate crisis. And while the science of wilding um, is reasonably well known, the science of ecosystem restoration, of, you know, of increasing biodiversity, um, uh, and these sorts of things, they're reasonably well known. When they're implemented in cities, it's fraught with complexities. So there's two kind of primary observations that drove the scheme for me. Uh, the first was that while you might think that everyone loves green cities, and particularly if you're white and middle class, the idea of a sort of a wild meadow uh, is appealing and attractive, um, one person's wild meadow is another person's kind of unkempt, uh, unloved, uh, you know, a bit of the city that's been forgotten, it's not been maintained, or it's a bit of the city that used to be a play area for their kids, or it used to be an area that was a sports facility that they're no longer able to use. Um, it might be a social space that they no longer have access to. It looks like, to some people, as a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a bit that somebody's just not taking care of anymore, and kind of is a, uh, an indication of how we've stopped caring about systems and spaces around our city. So you can't just expect to wild a neighborhood with the kind of biodiversity that is required and think that everyone's going to love it um, and support it. And actually all the evidence shows that if you don't explicitly involve people in the design and implementation and the governance of wilding schemes, then they're bound to fail. Um, and this really means not just kind of 19th, 20, uh, you know, kind of 20th century uh, consultation um, or even sort of 
polite participatory programs. It's me, it means actively involving people in decision making uh, about the design, about the deployment, about the funding, about the maintenance, um, and about how that is going to change over time in the future. It really requires a kind of, I'd like to think, a 21st century approach to governance. So the second observation that I had was that as we reframe our relationship to non-humans, as we wild the city, we really have to become a little wild ourselves. We have to be able to embrace that kind of um, uh, complexity, if you like, and the unexpectedness that being wild entails. So things like, you know, mice, they share our homes, they live in our walls, they eat the same food as us, they breathe the same air. We even use their cousins for experimentation for our medical purposes. I think it's absolutely essential that we reimagine, re-script, redefine how we relate to these non-human species that are so closely tied to us and to our future and actually figure out how to involve them in the decision-making for our cities. How do we actively involve non-humans in cooperating on the governance of our cities as we start to wild them? So very briefly, just I'm going to go kind of describe. Say again? Yeah, sure. Um, Rewild Rural Docs really was just about setting up a headquarter, developing a series of community initiatives to, where they are actively involved in defining and delivering various aspects of the scheme, transforming the landscape infrastructure in the typical way that one might in, in, in a rewilding scheme. But crucially, it's about reconfiguring the built environment to connect human, non-human, and urban systems. It's, the other aspect of this was about deploying a digital infrastructure to support multi-species communication. We've got a number of techniques, and in fact, we have centuries of experience of communicating with non-humans, but we've tended to forget about the way that we connect to them, the way that we communicate with them, the way that we can actually have empathy with them. So this was essentially a way of connecting humans and non-humans to each other so that we can discuss, deliberate, and ultimately decide on the future of our shared space. In summary, it was about redesigning infrastructure. It was about reimagining governance and specifically on decision making. Uh, it was about building on diverse experiences of green space, whether we're human or non-human. And it was about us becoming a little wild ourselves. Thank you. Fantastic. I, I really like the bit about making the impossible possible today, because that's what we've got to do. Um, next up, we have Andrew Grant of Grant Associates. He's a landscape architect based in Bath and now also increasingly in Singapore. And marking its 24th anniversary this year, Grant Associates is perhaps best known for uh, its pivotal role in Singapore's Garden by the Bay, which is itself already 10 years old. Uh, Andrew may share with us a few findings from Gardens by the Bay, I'm not sure. A reminder that landscapes take time to get established, uh, but it's well worth the, the investment and the wait. So, Andrew. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm to repeat a little bit of what Osman's just been talking about. For me, ecology is about the study of relationships between living organisms in their physical environment. So it is about humans and their relationship with other life species. And for me, the fundamental way to start to think about that is you have to think you have to design like you are part of nature, and so many people don't do that. And this is a, a challenge we gave some five-year-old kids. Imagine you're a tree. How do you place people into a different mindset? Wonderful sort of expressive ways of getting into that journey. Um, this was an, a painting I did when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and it's sort of, I've just dug it out because it's sort of really weird, isn't it? Because you have to imagine the future as well. We're talking about imagining the future. This is like a sort of a premonition of neoliberalism <laughs> gone, gone mad. So um, fortunately, I got out of that a little bit and went to university, studied landscape. I studied landscape with David Skinner, who basically taught under... Um, Ian McHarg, who wrote Design with Nature, a really definitive book. 
but it teaches you to really think about systems. How do we communicate systems? This is just a sketch of how do we think about water on a particular site. These are tools that we have to start to work with. Um, and increasingly sophisticated. As, uh, this, is, this is a tool that's just about to emerge, I think. It's called Sea Trees, developed by NASA scientists, which basically measures, calculates how many trees there are in the world and how they're helping with carbon sequestration. An extraordinary project that you should look into. Apparently there are 3 trillion trees, 60,000 species. Um, but it's not just about data, it's about how do we communicate joy and wonder as well. It's about these two things. How do we cr create spaces that people love and how do we create spaces that really work as ecosystems? So these are sort of two diagrams from the uh, from early days of the, uh, of the Gardens by the Bay um, where we had to work with lots of engineers, really sophisticated sort of thinking, but ultimately to create a place that becomes a real amazing place to be as a person and a biodiverse place as well in terms of multiple species. And one of the things that would really struck me was actually people respond to this because it's it awesome. It sort of it really sort of brings home to you the drama and the spectacle of what nature can be in a city. And it can create the most amazing home for, for wildlife. Um, it's now the biggest uh, sort of uh, population of smooth-coated otters in Singapore. Um, when we started, there were... Um, ten years ago, there were about four, 40 species of birds on the site. There are now 160. Um, and time is a really important factor in thinking about ecological futures. It doesn't just happen like that. It takes time. This is ten years since it was first opened. Um, so lots of big stories that, that we need to sort of learn from, lots of ways of thinking about things. But ultimately, we have to inspire people. This is... Um, our entry for the Chelsea Flower Show in 2020 by colleagues Peter Schmiel and Chin Chen, who developed the, the design. It was like a microcosm of Guangzhou in China, talking about the amazing infrastructure that they're putting in place for water management, for forests, for creating better environments for people. And, you know, we just distill that down into this little story, which is a beautiful garden. But within that, there are all those sort of aspects. Think about air quality, think about water management, think about biodiversity, think about joy. And a recent project that we've done, which I think also does that, this is the Tower of London Moat that we, we took over. Um, it had been like this since 1845, since Duke of Wellington actually drained the moat, a sterile piece of grass, occasionally populated with a tent or two. And through Superbloom, through the summer, it's been this amazing sort of festival of flowers, effectively. Incredible biodiversity. And this is setting the scene for the future of the moat. It's going to be a nature reserve as much as an amazing place to be as a, as a person. This, these are the sort of things we've got to think about. Transformation. And coming back to the point about community, designers engaging with community. This is a project I'm involved with in Bath. It's called Bathscape, which is trying to look after this amazing setting to this World Heritage Site. It's looking at impoverished parts of the city. It's looking at the diversity of the city. It's looking at the heritage. How do we create economy from this place? How do we reinforce the identity of this place using landscape and ecology? So nature and imagination, key elements of sustainable future cities. Thank you. Seconds remaining. Uh, our last speaker is landscape architect Sue Morgan, who is CEO of the Landscape Institute. She has worked strategically across many scales, from network rail and highways England to the Bankside Open Spaces Trust project, which some of you may know, one of my all-time favorites, and the Wandle Valley Regional Park. She is a powerful advocate of systems-based, multidisciplinary approaches to place-making, which feature co-creation. Sorry, technology. Um, hi, um, it's great to be here, uh, delighted. 
Um, and I'm so super excited to see uh, Explore Station as well uh, and the culmination of a load of really hard work of uh, people that I used to work with when I worked at the Design Council. Um, so fantastic to see all of that and get a chance to look at the immersive uh, design. It's, it's very exciting. Um, so excited to be here speaking on behalf of um, LI, uh, Landscape Institute, and our members. Um, and also to a sort of really multidisciplinary, problem-solving uh, audience, so fantastic to do that. And I think we can only address some of the problems that have been described by my fellow speakers um, if we work collaboratively, if we um, share our outcomes um, and learn and respect each other's professions um, and our working practice. So the Landscape Institute uh, represent members here in the UK and internationally, and together um, we represent uh, landscape architects and the wider landscape profession. But just, just a little bit about what landscape architects are. Um, it's the study and practice of designing environments of varying scales, encompassing art, engineering, ecology, horticulture, so uh, so sociology, sometimes misunderstood uh, as gardening, although we do have a number of esteemed garden designers and horticulturists as our members. But landscape designers create and enable life between buildings, uh, we create streetscapes, um, active travel opportunities. We help with uh, social housing and social landscapes and housing estates. Um, this is a great project in Camden. Um, playgrounds, play areas, sport opportunities, uh, recreation, amenity spaces. Um, amazing opportunities in linear landscapes. Um, and one that obviously is reflected uh, in my fellow speaker um, about how to look at sort of transport hubs, river corridors, and looking at amenity value as well as ecological value. Also, projects of uh, what if. This was a design competition that we ran with some students about what to do to uh, reuse multi-storey car parks. So fantastic opportunities for us to sort of think beyond and think the imagination. But also thinking for landscape designers about site design, master planning, strategic frameworking, planning and shaping cities. Also the landscape of the temporary, um, education and art. So this was for those of you that enjoyed this landscape um, at Somerset House, this was a fantastic opportunity uh, for learning about climate um, and ecology. And we also have the means to design iconic and enduring landscapes, um, you know, designed for health, 160 years old, um, you know, still there, and instinctively um, we know that this is good for us. Um, a real sort of uh, icon for me is Oxavia Hill, who uh, formed the National Trust um, in, um, in the early um, 18, well, mid-1800s. But this quote here really um, is an anchor, I feel, for the fact that we are, we're doing exactly the same thing now as we were then in Victorian times, creating the conditions and places and recognising that health and green space is important. So this was in uh, COP in Glasgow, uh, for those of you that were at there, um, and I think this is kind of where we need to be thinking right now. And there's a lot of stuff here that we know, right? We know that we've got heat um, and we've got, um, you know, different aspects around climate in the summers, hotter and wetter, and that we need sponges cities. We know that we're struggling with air pollution. Uh, we know that we have climate cynics. We know that we have a growing city global population. So, you know, most people are going to be living in cities, you know, in, in short decades to come. And we need to make our cities equitable in order to sort of cope with that. We know that the benefits of green infrastructure in terms of social and environmental benefits, you know, here's just a few, but we know these benefits and we've got lots and lots of research and we've got lots of case studies um, that surround that. But interesting from COVID perspective, um, you know, we also know that those are disadvantaged communities don't have access to green space. One in 10 households in Britain don't have access to uh, their own gardens. And if you're of colour, you're ten, four times more likely to not have access to sort of green space in your local area. So we know there's a direct correlation between deprived communities and access to good green space. So I put this in because I think this is just echoing a bit that what Osman was saying. Um, and I think it chimes with me about, you know, we can't be the master of all we survey and the bucolic landscapes and the idea of, of estates anymore. 
you know, we know now, and there's a, got a, a constructive dialogue about the notion of owned and controlled and subjugated landscapes and spaces, and we're out of step. You know, we, we're now beginning to deal with um, decolonialised spaces and making spaces more equitable um, and diverse. So my point of this uh, conversation about designing with landscape and nature, I've got three points here. So this is a quote from Ked Friend, uh, Fred Kent, founder of uh, Project for Public Space in America. And obviously, you know, we've got the means for good design. You know, we can do a lot better than this in terms of what we're expecting people to sort of, you know, live and experience. We also need to be thinking about, you know, designing for people. Another quote um, from said uh, Fred Kent. But this is absolutely true. And again, this chimes with what Osman was saying about uh, working with people. And, you know, if we work well with people uh, collaboratively in co-design, uh, true engagement, then you get better successful outcomes um, in the design of the spaces. And also in terms of the long-term stewardship, uh, this is Dalston Curve. This was only meant to be a temporary space. It's now a more permanent space because communities have actually said, voted with their feet, that they don't want to get rid of the space. This space is now permanent. But we need good activism, we need good opportunities for communities to get involved, we need endurance. And also, this could be rewilding, or this could be somebody's unkempt. But to me, this is about the main nutty problem when you have communities involved and opportunities of landscape, about stewardship, about models of community ownership, who owns the spaces, who controls the spaces. And finally, designing for the future. So something I'm very, very close to my heart and very, feel very strongly about. Um, and there's two aspects to this. Um, design Council's Design Economy Report still suggests that 78% more or less are, are male designers. We still have only 1% of architects designing in this country who are of colour. Um, landscape industry has a real issue with diversity. Um, we've recently signed an action plan about addressing uh, quality in the built environment um, because unless you have a diverse designed workforce, you're not going to get well-inclusive designed spaces. But more troubling, I think, is the fact that we, we want to embrace ecology. We want ecological futures. We want places that are going to be equitable but also help with climate change and adaptation and mitigation. But we literally do not have the skills in this country to actually deliver and implement some of the desired policy objective outcomes that um, the government want. Um, this quote comes from the House of Lords uh, Science and Technical Committee, uh, 2000, uh, 2021. Um, and this isn't just about landscape architects and designers, this is about ecologists, this is about biologists, this is about forestry people, arboriculturists. This is about people that really understand not just how, how we design spaces, but how we're actually going to look after them and uh, implement them in the future. So that's something we absolutely have to look at and focus on uh, getting the next generation into landscape professions, about getting universities to take on and deliver more landscape-based, place-based land um, opportunities for study. Um, and get more conditions for sort of people to sort of come into the profession. So in summary, um, we need to design with landscape and nature, design for people and design for the future. And I'll just leave you with this because that's kind of you know, lovely image from, uh, from China um, and also sort of building for next generations. Thank you. For fantastic presentations, can I invite all the panelists to come for a quick, quickly, because we're running a little behind here, and I want to leave time for discussion. Really fantastic images of, you know, inspirational projects from around the globe. I think, you know, I can't resist starting with this big question to all of you, really. You know, when you look at Sue's last image or some of the images Andrew showed in China and the scale of the, the problem, um, how does that, what needs to be done there? How does that inform uh, uh, what you do here in this country? And, you know, down to the basic, of, you know, kind of work that, that Usman is doing. I don't know who would like to, to take that first. Does it mean everybody needs to urgently work at their own scale and not think about those huge challenges across the world? 
I'll, I'll chip in a little bit. Um, the reality is there's just so much to be done and so much to be done quickly. So we have the challenges of not enough good people, the skilled people, we don't have the skills, but actually there's an imperative that something has to happen. And I think one of the differences, I guess, between this country and other places that we're working, like Singapore and China, is that when decisions do get made, they, they happen, things get implemented. Not necessarily always in the right way, perhaps, but there's a speed to the process, whereas in this country, we're wrapped in process and planning and dialogue and so many things which are entirely right at one level, but entirely holding things back in terms of making change. Can I give the floor to Neil? Because I think you probably face those challenges day in and day out. Yes, I think um, I was just thinking, well, I think as we put up the picture of the not everybody likes green stuff, not everybody likes to look at the railway. Um, they like the green stuff in the way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's you know, we've, we've been rewilding the railway for a number of years because of changes in the management that we've done. We now need to get it back to being able to run it safely. And it's, it comes to the education. A number of the talks earlier on today, would, that's that community engagement, is getting it across to people to understand why we're doing what we're doing. I put the picture of the man with the chainsaw and the tree stump. To, to demonstrate to people what we're doing and why we're doing it. I think if we can engage people and do it that way, we can get the interest and then we can get more foresters like myself doing work with the railway, with the other utilities. And then you get to more people. We talked about the 500, uh, you know, within 500 metres of the railway, one third of the population of Britain. There must be somebody in there who can follow what I'm doing and it's getting that engagement. And if people can then understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, the work in Singapore, it, it just, it, it gives you that connection. And I think that's the, mm. the bit that we need to get. So you've been trialing techniques, both of you, ways of getting that engagement. What observations do you have about how that, you know, this kind of bottom-up involvement makes better, makes better outcomes? Um, or is essential, really? I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating just because I'm trying to think of something reasonably optimistic to say. Um, <laughs> because I think that the reality of it, particularly when we're looking at this country, as Andrew kind of pointed out, is that there are a whole load of systemic issues at play here that actually no single person can do anything. And um, I know you, you actually asked... I think in one of the emails, you know, for us to reflect on what impact we might have had with the project. And my answer to that was, well, kind of none, uh, in the sense that, you know, taken in isolation, like, you know, you don't ask, you don't necessarily ask a car, a single car, what's your, con you know, what's your contribution to the traffic jam? It's the mass that becomes the phenomenon. I think it's the same with tackling climate science, uh, the, the climate emergency. One specific thing I will mention is um, we did an air, crawl, air quality project called Pollution Explorers Collective Action. And the bottom line of that project was we, we ran two different air quality experiments, trying to activate people to do things to improve air quality. And in one group, it was the typical kind of air quality experiment uh, initiative where you give people lots of information, you try and engage them in the issues, you track and monitor how, they, um, how they're doing over the course of several months, and you feed back along the way to say, you're doing this, this much, you're doing this much. Um, and then we did exactly the same experiment, but separated people into groups of eight to 10, and simply made it possible for them to communicate with each other. And although that was more expensive to run, it had twice the impact on air quality per pound spent, just by enabling them to to talk to each other, not even telling them what to do. Um, and so I think in terms of tackling all these kind of systemic prisoner's dilemma kind of issues, I think simply getting people to talk is the first step to resolving prisoner's dilemma. You can't cooperate if you're not 
connected. connected. And it's not about us as designers saying, we're connecting you so that you change your behavior, so that you do X, Y, and Z, and therefore you're going to improve the environment, because that doesn't manifestly work. It's, we're connecting you together, you figure out what you want to do and why. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the projects you've shown have this kind of involvement, like the Dalston Curve. And... Yeah, I think there's, um, there's, there's a couple of things, really. I, I think there's a deep frustration that I have about the fact that there are a lot of answers to climate change and equitable, you know, well-designed space that's great for human beings. Um, and there's a massive GDP ticket around that as well. And, you know, it's, it's very frustrating that, you know, people can't see that. <laughs> um, and actually, it's it, it's low cost, um, you know, in, um, investment really in the grand scheme of things. So that's that's kind of one thing. I think the other thing from uh, the Landscape Institute's perspective, um, obviously, we want to champion and, and really engage with people to get them switched on to what landscape design and landscape profession in its widest context, you know, can offer as, as a career route uh, to, to, to scratch that itch really around um, wanting to be able to put something back um, and get engaged with climate. So that's something that we're really, you know, heavily invested in at the LI. In relation to community engagement, I think I'd I'd, I'd, I'd go back to the Bankside Open Spaces Trust and I'd, I'd pick up on um, the point that Andrew made about things take time. So um, I remember working at Southwark Council um, and, you know, starting off with this tiny little idea of, you know, a number of residents came and said, there are these nine spaces in the Bankside space and we're worried that they're going to um, be built on. Can you help us? And that's how it started. And that was, you know, that's kind of like more than 20 years ago now. <laughs> there's, a, there's a colleague in the audience who knows exactly the dates. Um, I'm sure she'll remind me. Um, but, but it's taken a long time. Regeneration takes a long time. Building communities take a long time. And the success of that charity now is that they are embedded in the community. The community trusts them. Yeah. Um, and they have, you know, an equitable relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can't do any of these things at speed, is, is, is the answer. Yeah, well, Bankside, 20 years, that's amazing. Because you see the results now, and I guess you have to see results on the ground for people to begin to, to trust the change yeah. is possible. Yeah, and I think there's, there's, there's also the balance between that kind of gentrification question, mm. you know, and, you know, keeping the local community. And I think S SE1 is a, is a really good example where there is significant social housing. Um, there's still, you know, uh, deprivation and there's still inequality, but there seem to be happy bedfellows. Although some people, I'm sure, would disagree with what I'm said. <laughs> Let me take a few questions, if there are questions from the audience. It's very dark. Yes, can you introduce yourself, please? please. Yes. Uh, yeah, Jen Langley. I'm a volunteer at a local mini park called Sunray Gardens in Herne Hill. So there's six of us, and we're 60 years old. And we're trying to get the local secondary school to come and learn about biodiversity in this big lake and try and get them interested. And I was wondering if there's any kind of qualification. I think there's a GCSE being introduced on land-based funds or something for young people. I'm wondering how we can build a bridge to the school. Oh, I'm wondering how we can build a bridge to the school kids to stop, get them to stop littering, which they do now, yeah. and come and get interested in restoring this beautiful ornamental lake. So I think there's, there's, there's lots and lots of things that you could get involved with there. There's wildlife trusts in Herne Hill. There is loads of other um, voluntary sector organisations quite close by. Um, I think in terms of secondary school kids, it's, it's about sort of demonstrating those routes through into other professions. So, you know, geography, I mean, if you scratch away at the surface of most landscape architects, there's usually geography in there somewhere. Um, so I think human geography and geography is a kind of, you know, well, maybe not no. art of geography, but I think that's, that's one of the secrets to, the, to success with landscape is that it does, it straddles a number of different um, um, experiences really in education. So whether it's science or whether it's geography or whether it's sociology or whether it's art, um, you need to know how to draw. <laughs> you see some Andrews. A level experience, um, but I think you know actually helping the teachers understand how what you're doing directly relates to aspects around the curriculum, um, 
And then I would say, controversially, lobby hard so that we keep STEAM subjects as well as STEM. <laughs> Andrew, you were shaking your head. Did you have something to add? Um, no, it's just, I, I, just to dismiss the preconception that landscape architects are all geographers as well. Uh -huh. I, I, did, you know, I did study geography at O level, but <laughs> all those years ago. No, I was definitely more all the science, sciences and art. From, uh, just thinking, again, going back to some of the other presentations that have been on earlier today, there was uh, an amazing one about augmented reality where they were putting a, a, a new footbridge over the railway and you know it was all done with virtual reality and gaming and there was a chap there from Epic Games and you know I've never sat in a presentation for work, Andrew, sorry, uh, where Fortnite was, was a, a key theme and Minecraft came up. And, just having a 16 and a 13 year old myself and being a cub leader, knowing what eight to 10 year olds deal with, the, the gaming element might get the kids. If they can build your nature reserve in Minecraft or Fortnite, possibly without some of the uh, explosives, um, that might get them engaged as to what is possible. Nature's a nightmare because it doesn't read the books, but it'll come if you build it and they might come if you build it and it, it just might be that switch that you need to get them interested in the wet, muddy, green stuff, albeit on a, starting off on a computer screen and then getting them out there because they'll recognize it. Oh, I did that. I put that hole in that ground over there on a computer screen. Now, let's see what happens if I do it for real. That, it just might be a link. Um, that, that's just one thought that might help. Or catch them younger. Catch them in primary school. That's yeah. Is there another question? I think we have time for one more. Absolutely. Let's take one more. Can you introduce yourself, please? The mic is coming. One sec. Uh, my name is Artemis Morgan. I'm an architecture student. Um, I was just wondering, Sue, you mentioned all these skills that are lacking. I was wondering if you could just say a bit more, like, what are the skills that are lacking in the UK? You mean in terms of landscape profession? You said there was on that slide, you said yep. that in terms of ecology and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, just taking ooh, taking ARBs and uh, forestry for starters. So if we've, we've got one of the policy aspects around rewilding and uh, reforestation and whole initiatives and sort of grant funding for, um, you know, taking parts of the UK through natural England, you know, we don't have enough people <laughs> trained in forestry uh, or arboricultural. Or I can't say arboricultural. I can't say it. Tree people to, <laughs> to 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 do stuff for us. Whether that's actually you're growing trees, planting trees, and husbandry afterwards. Um, Natural England, Defra. You know, actually, the civil service are also sort of missing skilled people that understand what they are putting into their policies and strategy documents. So. And it, 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 it stems from people not actually going from, you know, A-levels into uh, universities to study land-based um, uh, opportunities. But also, and I think, you know, Andrew will attest to this, we used to have universities that ran landscape degree courses. Um, you know, there were many, many more of them. And a number of universities have stopped running those courses. Landscape architecture is now on the kind of endangered list uh, of professions. Um, so we're a rare and they, breed. There's so many. <laughs> I think you can't be hired fast enough, right? I mean, uh, yeah. graduates are being snapped up at the moment. Exactly. I mean, we've just finished a sector skill survey, which we'll be sharing with all our members quite soon. But you know, there's a 48% uh, run rate of uh, re our registered practices that can't fill posts. Now that's a that's combination crazy. of breakfast, Brexit, but also breakfast even, Brexit, <laughs> um, but also just not having enough people coming through but also we don't have the opportunities for people who want to do a change of career um, and, and we want to try and make it easier to get professional qualifications for that um, so, so arms and trees is one but it, it is really across the board whether it's landscape architects whether it's landscape um, you know contractors you know it's just across the piece really one idea that keeps coming up again and again, and I don't know how, how you all would respond to this, is rather than having 
architects channeling in, landscape architects channeling in, engineers, built environment engineers channeling in, that there's a foundation year where you mm. get an exposure to all this so you have mm. a broader understanding of the built environment as a whole mm. and then people can make a more informed choice of mm. which, which of those pathways they, they want to follow. It'll never happen, but it seems like such a good idea. Actually, though, I mean, it used to, yeah. in, in lots of places. Mm. I mean, when I studied, mm. we shared the first year with the architect students mm. in, in Edinburgh. Mm. Yeah. And certainly in, in Bath, the university, the architect students, they, they, they yeah. share the first year with the engineers. Bath, and all those people yeah. are at the top of the profession yeah. today. So, I mean, but it's the minority, isn't it, of mm. weird things. And, and landscape architects are the tiny minority. I think we represent less than 1% of the professionals in the built environment in the UK. Mm, and at a time when the skills that we <laughs> offer are absolutely essential to rethinking how we create a more sustainable, ecological framework for urban living. How many um, people here are landscape architects or training to be landscape architects? Oh. <laughs> One. <laughs> oh, maybe you need to think again. Maybe um, you need to think again. We, we, we've managed to attract lots of architecture students into, into landscape and they've stayed. They've stayed in landscape. So yeah. welcome if you, if, you, if you want to. Conversion courses. Um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we are out of time. I, I, this is, we could easily go on for another 20 minutes. I, I'd like to introduce Roland Carthouse from the Design Council, who's going to wrap up and tell us a little bit about the Explore Station project. Roland. Thank you, Hattie. Um, and I'd just like to start by thanking uh, the whole panel, uh, Neil Strong, Andrew Grant, Usman Hack, Sue Morgan, and for chairing Hattie Harmon. Thank you. So for those of you that uh, only joined this session, didn't, didn't uh, join the previous session, uh, I thought I'd give a bit of context about the Design Council's role in Explore Station. Uh, with our partners Commonplace, Digital Urban and the Glass House Community-Led Design, we've undertaken this programme of engagement with the British public. We asked them their th for their thoughts and ideas on Network Rail's new proposed design for small and medium-sized stations across Great Britain. Explore Station follows another programme, Think Station, in which we asked people what a station could be and what they want from them. People said they wanted their stations to play a community role and Network Rail ran an international competition to find a design that responded to that vision. Uh, some of you may have experienced the uh, virtual reality experience in the digital studio, which uh, is now closed for the day. Um, but this virtual reality experience along with um, wider workshops, uh, took place across Great Britain and received over 4,500 pieces of feedback, comments, thoughts and ideas in return. Uh, this feedback gives a real insight into what people want and care about in our communities and places and also what they want from their infrastructure. You can read these insights in the report that's available here today. Uh, we took key themes from this treasure trove of information to set the topics we discussed throughout the day at the London Design Festival. Uh, th that concludes this session. Uh, our next keynote session uh, is taking place in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>